participate in this discussion this afternoon as this region is my region. Um, I am originally from Trinidad and Tobago. I am proud to be from Trinidad and Tobago. And um, just to share a bit about what life is in Trinidad and Tobago, it's all about paradise. Um, it's all about fun, relaxation. We do work hard, um, but we do love to go to the beach, which I have displayed here. We do love to eat, and so I've shown you some of our lovely street foods that we have, like doubles and crab and dumpling and bacon shark. Um, one of our um, greatest points of tourism is carnival, um, which we have every year. I'm not sure we're going to have carnival next year because of the pandemic, which will be very disappointing. And it would also um, make us lose a lot of revenue. Um, during that time of the year. Um, and so this picture here, I'm standing here, this is last year when I took some of our students from Morgan State to Trinidad and Tobago on a study abroad trip. Um, and we took them to the Pitch Lake. Now the Pitch Lake is um, the largest resource of asphalt um, in the world. And so we provide um, asphalt to all of the countries within the world. So when you're driving, what you're driving on the pitch, it comes from Trinidad and Tobago. So um, let's get into this um, and introduce our panelists um, and hear a bit about um, what their, their experience and what they have done in the countries that they are in. So let's start with Walter. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm Walter Hosey and I'm here in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. I've lived here about 12 years now. I've been traveling here for the last 25 years or so. Um, Bianca. Hi, I'm Bianca. Um, I live in Costa Rica, particularly in the Manuel Antonio Campos area. I live in a beautiful beach town. I've actually been here pretty newly for six months and, you know, I live in paradise. It's, you know, it's a Great place to live. Great. Great. And Crystal. Hey. Hey everybody, I'm Crystal. I am currently in DC. I'm the program coordinator for the Patricia Roberts Harris Public Affairs Fellowship at Howard University. Um, and I spent some time in Columbia in 2015 and 2016, um, both doing internships and doing little research projects as well. All right. All right, so we'll start with the first question and so um, describe a unique challenge or experience from your time abroad and, what did, and why did you select this location to live in? Any, anyone can start. Uh, I can start. Okay. Uh, well, for me, uh, again, I, I've, I've been here in Oaxaca for about 12 years or so, um, but I first studied here to, in undergrad uh, when I was finishing up my, my sophomore year, received a scholarship to come here for a summer. Um, and I had started coming here every summer after, uh, after that experience. And one of the things that really struck me was that here in Oaxaca, people had not been taught that there was anything to fear uh, when it came to being a, an African-American male. And so when I walked around the street and talked to people, uh, you know, everyone just kind of accepted me for whatever energy I brought to the table. Um, and that was just a very freeing experience for me. And, uh, and so I kind of always kept it in the back of my mind. And, uh, and again, about 13 years ago, I decided, hey, I'm, you know, the States is really great, but I think I'm going to try something different um, because of, of that base of just being in a place where I always felt comfortable and welcome. So I'll, I'll stop. Yeah, and similarly, I think um, when I was in Colombia, something that was really interesting to me was um, the type of conversations around race and also the lack of conversations around race in the specific area that I was the first time I was in Medellin. And I remember specifically an experience with my friend who in the United States wouldn't be considered black, but over there, because she was the darkest person in the room often. She was considered black and I was talking about the Colombian day of blackness and she was like, well, Crystal, like we're not, we're not like negras, we're morenas. And 
that took me back. I was like, well, I don't know about you, but like, I'm black and I'm cool with that. And that was something that kind of kept coming up. Um, it was cool to see how kids were having those conversations more than it seemed like the adults were. And it was cool to see like how um, feelings of blackness seemed to be evolving. But I, that wasn't something that I was expecting. And it was interesting and exciting and challenging sometimes too. To uh, kind of piggyback off of what like Crystal is saying, in Costa Rica, like my blackness was so celebrated. You know, everybody was just like, you are so beautiful in your skin. You know, it wasn't in the same way that it's, it's a big contrast in the conversation that you have in the United States, which, you know, blackness can be stressful. It can be the, symb uh, the symbolism of the oppression that we're experiencing. And out in Costa Rica, you know, you can just be in your skin, you can celebrate. Yes, you know, to the Morena, to the black woman, you know, it's kind of just like always in that sense of like uplifting who I am and what I already knew as a black woman, but to kind of always like have that affirmation here, because I wasn't for sure necessarily living here, it's different from being a tourist of how they really were going to take me. And, you know, like many other people who travel, how do they treat black people? Am I gonna have the same experience? Am I gonna have to worry about the police? And it's not in that same way. And it's really like, you can take a like a sigh of relief and like relax in your blackness and celebrate it and you don't have to worry about kind of being pulled down from the same things that you experience in the states wonderful so what i what i got from you all is that you enjoy the the carefree living of the places that you're in um conversations around race it's not too much it's not too, as heavy as it is in the u.s um, which is which is which is true, um, and then the feelings of blackness. You are free to be black. Um, you can express yourself more than you can in the U.S. Right? Yes. Yeah. And then also to kind of you know answer you know the experience of being abroad, the community, the sense of community. I'm sure that y'all experience that in Latin culture. Of uh, you know, I know in Costa Rica, I can walk down the street and I say hola vida to multiple people it's you know although we can't really touch each other we're still giving that sense of um, air kisses and hugs and you know when I'm walking down the street somebody might see me and I might be in a rush because I'm just used to that lifestyle and they, they stop me in the middle and they say hey no come have you know a service or a beer with me come connect come you know let's enjoy this moment you don't have to rush and be busy and have a five-year plan everywhere you're walking around. You can enjoy yeah. time with me. You can enjoy the sunset. That's wonderful. Great. All right. So let's move on to question two. And tell me about how did your experience as a Black American in your host country differ from living in the U.S.? I know we kind of touched on that. But in, what, in your opinion, what is the root of difference um, in these, between the two places? I guess I'll go again. I'll start again. Um, uh, well, in, in my case, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's always a layered uh, response to a question like that because, you know, we have so many different experiences in the U.S. Uh, you know, and I'm not a person that had you know, necessarily a negative experience growing up or anything that, that pushed me overseas. Um, but what I will say is that, you know, I've taken students from Howard University for the past 10 years here. Um, to study abroad, and uh, it's something I've actually been doing for about 20 years, but, but you know, the last 10 years kind of exclusively as while I'm working here in Oaxaca. And I think what is really interesting is that we all seem to carry, if you're African American, particularly just born and raised in the United States, you have this kind of like book bag full of, of all, the, all the experience that you just carry around. Mm -hmm. And you, you feel it like I go to the airport to welcome the students to Oaxaca and in Oaxaca when, you know, it's a small airport. So, you know, the families come, people have balloons, signs, you know, it's, it's a big event. And I come and I'm, and I go to give my typical Oaxaca hug, you know, which is, you know, this is how we greet each other here. And the, the you feel the energy 
the 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 wall that's right there. So I you know I've learned to do the side hug, you know, as we all you know, know and we don't know folks that well. But um but you feel that that burden and and the challenge that the students have and I have as a coordinator to help them kind of take things out of that book bag and leave them to the side for a little bit so they can just walk around a little bit lighter, speak to people when they when they are spoken to um and 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 in a friendly way, not to feel like they're judged. You know, you know, we have students who come out here and 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 even when you say that they're beautiful, they actually don't have. Uh, they don't, they're not even sure how they're supposed to respond to that. Yeah. Um, you know, are we? Am I being exoticized? Or you know, what you ain't ever seen on black people before? Or, you know, all these different things. Uh, you know, my father who came out here ten years ago. You know, at that time, a fifty-seven-year-old black man. You know, six-two, about my same height. And the police were riding by in a big truck with uh, their guns and all that stuff, which is just how the police walk around here. And, uh, you know, they were staring at him, according to him. And so he immediately got nervous and did what most of us do. And we would look down when we see the cops. And they were like, hey, where are you from? You know, and they were telling him where to get a, a, a better donut. They showed that he had a donut in his hand. And, and he came back to the house like, damn, like, you know, I'm walking around here all nervous and these folks are inviting me out for food. And like, you could see how that experience just like opened up his mind. And so, you know, I, you know, again, that's not exactly the answer to that question in essence, you know, in terms of personally, but I would just say that is something that I see that somehow that U U.S. life uh, can be so heavy and burdensome. And it's really a challenge when you go someplace else to just kind of like, hey, my identity has changed here. Let me see what it is first. Let me start a new. So I'll, stop, I'll stop there. Yeah, I, everything you said, like I feel that. I think I specifically chose to go to Columbia because there wasn't a lot of options for study abroad outside of the U.S. or outside of very um, European-esque university abroad experiences. Um, and my experience being there for many reasons, I, I felt like I could breathe for a second. Um, I think that's mostly because um, the baggage that you talk about didn't exist in the same way there. And it was really exciting and it was really liberating at the same time that it was important to think about like, okay, that's my experience as a black American, but what are people who are black in, in Colombia feeling every day? And so that was a really interesting experience. Um, more to the topic of Black Americans versus like being abroad versus being here in the U.S., I was really interested in the perspectives of Black women and what that meant abroad. I think here there's this super wide conception that Black women are angry or bitter, um, and that's like the more oppressive, negative, stereotypical view. And in some ways, like that does exist in Latin America too. But generally, when people spoke about Black women, it was to praise their beauty or to talk about how happy they were, which I think there's some there's problematic tendencies there, too, because then we can talk about over-sexualization and we can talk about, like, a lot of the other things, right? But it was just very interesting to experience how people were perceiving me in a different way. Um, and so that's another thing on Colombia. And I mean, I'm supposed to speak to Colombia, but if I could speak to being in Mexico really quick too, I was there for a study abroad program, I think right after my freshman year of undergrad. And the experience was really interesting because I didn't see a lot of people who look like me where I was, I was in Puebla. Um, and anywhere I walked, like people wanted to take pictures. There was a soccer team that took pictures. Um, and I was walking across the street and like there was a group of little kids and they just start clapping. And I don't know who they thought I was, but I was like, oh, like <laughs> it was really interesting at the same time that it was kind of unnerving because I felt like I was always being watched. Um, and it, it was also just kind of really interesting to see how little interaction with other black folks people had, because especially because there is a black population in Mexico. Um, and so, those were a lot of different experiences. Oh, and lastly, to Bianca's point about the community, yes, in Colombia, in Cali, there's this huge festival. It's the largest or the second largest black festival in Latin America. 
and the level of community that people like showed like if I was like hey like I'm American because they're like where are you from they're like oh it doesn't matter like you're black come chill like let's hang out um obviously the slang is different but still um so I'll end there and you know what um both of y'all exactly the exact same experience to kind of just like piggyback like uh, whenever I see the, actually, I don't really see the police here. There's really just not that much of existence. And Campos Manuel Antonio is so peaceful. You know, if you have an, if you have a problem, you can know that your neighbor is there to assist you with whatever you need. You know, the first thing for them to do is not to jump to like, let me call the police for help. It's like, hey, you know, I might know my CEO or my CEO or my neighbor, somebody can do it and boom, it is taken care of. So it's that community experience. So I don't really see the police. And if I do, they might wave at me. They might be like, hey, how you doing? You know, in Spanish, of course, make sure till the BM, great. And you know, also one other thing is, you know, a lot of in our lives, we've only heard about our black ancestors um, from the States. But one thing I've really learned about is the extension of our blackness in, the, in Latin America and kind of learning that history. And a lot of the Ticos, not even just black, um, not even just black Ticos, but white Ticos do know their African history here. You know, there's a province in Limon and a lot of people do know the history. So I've learned a lot and it's made me push into more research and into blackness around the world the history around the world and you know what it's even made me more proud of what i already was and taught to be um, of my blackness like we are around the world and we are doing it you know and so you know i'm really thankful for that and kind of learning the experiences of other i still have so many more people to talk to but of really learning about those experiences of those afro latinas what their experience what they bring to the world because i haven't really had that much communication with them. You know, what, the, what Bianca just shared, um, when we take our students to Trinidad and Tobago, um, we take them to what we call the military museum. And so all of this history that they learn, they come out with this realization that the US and places, countries in the Caribbean and in Latin America, they are so heavily connected, which they never knew before because they weren't taught in schools what the connection was they just know that the caribbean exists and it's this place where you go for for parties and all that stuff but they don't know the historical connection or or the the racial the race connection um in terms of blackness so it's, it's really nice to see the students have that experience and come come out thinking similarly to you so yeah all right um so let's go to question three um, did you or do you feel that you have privilege as a Black American citizen in the country that you're in? Why or why not? And if so, in what areas? Yes, I'll start again. Um, what, I, what I'll say, and it's, it's a very simplistic uh, example, but um, it is a beautiful feeling. Um, it is a very freeing feeling to be in a situation where when you introduce yourself, people just assume you got it together. They assume like you have to prove you're crazy um, and, and prove you're not intelligent um, versus it being kind of vice versa. So, you know, as a quick example, so in the States, you know, sometimes, you know, you say, well, I got to use this, this type of English when I'm around these folks so they can think I have it together. You know, I won't put a name on it, but I think most people understand what I'm saying. Um, and, and that is a burden, you know, it's like sometimes, you know, I want to smile when I want to smile. I want to be, you know, friendly just because, you know, I'm feeling great today, but I don't want to feel forced and, 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 and almost like something that's obligatory um, to put you at ease because you feel like, you know, you may have a certain assumption about me. And so, you know, when you're overseas as a black American, it's like you, people see me as American first. They assume, you know, there's no concept of like, you, you know, a young man went to Mexico to find the Mexican dream, you know, and, 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 and it, 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 there's no Americans. You're like, they know if you're here, you had the money to get on the plane. So they assume you have some more money, sometimes much more money. Yeah. Than you um, so people assume that you can pay, 
they assume that you were there to do something positive instead of negative. Um, and even when you meet other Americans, you know, you're almost at this, you kind of equal, you're both foreigners, um, you know, you're not from here. And so you just engage in people in, in such a freeing way where, you know, it's just whatever naturally comes up in a conversation. Um, and I think that is a, it's, I don't, maybe people wouldn't put it as a privilege, um, but when you live, you know, 32 years without that privilege and suddenly you, you're able to just kind of be yourself, um, it, it feels like that. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I'll go. Very similar, um, especially when I first moved here, they looked at me like I was a tourist. So all they saw was like, you know, hey, come over, you want some drinks, come over here, you want some food, you want a massage, you want to surf. And then finally, I would every time I'd be like, I live here, like, y'all are gonna leave me with no money <laughs> if everybody keeps asking me if I want to do a tourist thing. And it took me like two months before I started getting local prices, then seeing me repetitively, you know, so now the prices have really dropped down for me. But, you know, they don't see me as, like, they see me as American, you know, they see me as, like, a certain box. And it's very interesting to see the contrast because in Costa Rica, um, it's more nationalist. So me being American gives me more privilege. But the problem that they kind of have now that I know a lot more about the country is with Nicaraguans. And so the Nicaraguans are kind of just more like the oppressed group and the way that they get treated is poorly here. Um, so it's kind of interesting that um, I saw one of my friends being kind of treated poorly and I used, I had to use my privilege, which is, you know, kind of, you're not used to being in that position where it's like, oh no, hey, no, like you don't treat, you know, somebody like that. And, you know, for them to listen to me, it's very polar opposite kind of in that space of privilege. So definitely you can kind of see the difference between going back to the States and here. Yeah, and I mean, I'd say for the simple fact of being American, you have privilege. Like, we are often taught in the U.S. from a very American exceptionalist background where, like, the, everything revolves around the U.S., right? And that translates to how people are treated around the world. Of course, there's still racism and things, but when people know that you're American, you're treated differently. And I think that has really real implications for the people who are from the place, like local people um, from the place that you go to. Um, I think, uh, for example, one of my friends was talking about how he wanted to go into a shopping mall and then he was being followed and harassed. And then once he started speaking English, they were like, oh, like my bad. And like acted like they didn't know or understand when he switched back to Spanish and just kind of like brushed it off. Um, and so I, I think yeah, the, the privilege is real. Um, and I think we have to constantly check ourselves on that um, and make sure that we're not reproducing different inequalities that can happen. Um, and that kind of, somebody mentioned like being seen as American first. And like, I still remember when that first hit me. Because again, this is Mexico and not Colombia, but I was sitting with my friends, two of whom were white and American. And somebody walked past and was like, hey, are y'all the Americans? And we were like, yeah. And he was like, oh, man, I hate Americans. And just like walked away. And I was like, oh, my gosh, y'all, did you hear that? And they were like, yeah, like, people don't like Americans. And I was like, but like, he included me in that. Because like, as an African American, like, I don't often feel like when people talk about Americans, they're also including me in that. And so in recognizing that he had very real reasons to not like the U.S., me, as somebody who was born in the U.S., like, I'm a part of that. And if I'm not trying to correct in my behaviors the things that, like, make people dislike Americans, then I'm just part of the problem, too. Um, I think in Colombia, too, there was a, a joke my friend mentioned one time. He was like, oh, something, something. Like, he mentioned something about something being bombed, and it was a weird joke, but I digress. And he was like, but you would know about that because you're American. And I was like, hmm, okay, okay. And he was like, no, I'm kidding. And talked about how our relationship made him not dislike Americans so much. But again, I think that it's really important to just think about like 
how are we in our actions not replicating behaviors, um, not like showing off wealth and stuff like that. So that way people don't dislike us. And also so that way people who are from the places that we go to aren't negatively impacted by the privilege that we have. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. So I'm going to ask Walter a question because once when I prepare students to go abroad, um, this is a big topic um, in terms of having privilege as a U.S. citizen because I, I had a I had a few instances where students went abroad and they felt as if, you know, because they were a citizen or because they were a black American, you know, certain things had to be done for them at certain times. And I had to, I had to check them and say, no, you are in a different country. You are not in the United States. From the minute you step off that plane or from the minute you step onto the plane to leave the United States, that privilege has to go out the door. So how do you prepare your students for something like this? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, what I, what I do, and, 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 you know, there's many different ways of navigating this, but I do a full, uh, what they call a hazing night uh, orientation, um, where we do a series of uh, bonding exercises, leadership development type exercises, uh, you know, all those, you know, trusts, uh, ex exercises, um, because there's a few things. I mean, when a group dynamic, um, you know, I always say your worst, your best, and your worst characteristics go will come across when you go abroad. Um, you know, so if you're somebody that you know is like always like you can figure out a positive spin on everything, um, that serves you, you know, well when you're abroad. But also, you know, on the other end, if you have some other traits that aren't as positive, um, they come out. And so, one, I try to create this situation where there's such a group dynamic of like, we are responsible for each other mm -hmm. that you having a bad day language wise, you know, here for, for Spanish, but you know, I think again, we translate to any experience. If you're having a bad day, a bad moment, about to do something that I think is probably not best for the group, the environment is such that, and the culture of the group is such that I am supposed to tell you, hey, slow that down for a mm -hmm. second. You know, Walt wouldn't like that. Hey, let's let's try to you know leave up out of here. And so I, I think the bonding of the group is important because you have people from different uh, backgrounds, uh, you know, ages. You know, in terms of where they are in the in the school. I'm assuming you know, sophomore, or junior, senior, etc. Um, but just you know, people who who will respond to certain freedoms, um, you know, very differently. So I think that's important. Um, I think the presence of the coordinator and the director. Um, kind of establishing early on that um, if you're having any issues, um, you know, I have to, it is my responsibility to, to pull you to the side. Um, and I actually do something where I ask people individually, okay, if you're having a bad day, how do you like to be addressed? You know, some people want, you know, a conversation, some people, you know, need to be pulled aside, some, you know, all those different things. So um, I try to individualize it. Um, to the extent that I can, because uh, you know, I'll just like look at my notes real quick. Like, okay, this person said, you know, just give me give me five minutes before you reprimand me. You know, that type of thing. Like, whatever it is, uh, you know, just trying to get to know the group. So I think that uh, you know that helps as well. And so the question, just so I understand, is um, like, how do you prepare yourself to make sure that you're not like abusing your privilege? How do you prepare stu like students going into that? Because automatically they think, well, I'm American and I'm Black American. I can do whatever I want in whatever country I want. But it's not necessarily so. Once you step on that plane, that privilege goes. Mm, yeah. I or think you should get rid of that privilege or those <laughs> ideas. <laughs> right, exactly. And I think there's a really good article that I love to share with people. Um, it's by June Jordan, who's an author, and she talks about um, Black travel and the ethics of that. And also what does that mean um, when we talk about consumptive tourism? So by that, I mean tourism in which people are going abroad to kind of like consume a culture, take a culture and not necessarily have a mutually beneficial relationship. And so I like to have those conversations with students. How are we making sure that as opposed to being tourists, we are making sure that we're being like visitors at the least. Um, like. How would you act if you were going down the street to like your grandma's house and you didn't know everybody in the neighborhood like you would 
probably try to like connect with some folks, especially because like you want to make sure that like you're being respectful and things like that. And so just encouraging people to think about travel like that. Like how can you be a visitor? How can you make sure that you're being humble and not expecting everything to be done in the way that you're used to because you're in a different context. Um, I've unfortunately been in situations, study abroad, where I've seen students ask or rather demand things <laughs> that um, were kind of extravagant and also not necessarily the way that things were done. And not only did it offend the people from that country, and this country specifically is Cuba, but it also like negatively impacted them because there was a culture shock of realizing that um, what I thought I was getting into isn't what happened. And so when Walter talks about like how he prepares students, I think that's great. I think to the extent that students can read about like um, the places that they're going to and also read about like where are the black communities, how are they experiencing their blackness in this country? Um, like that's always super beneficial. Okay. All right. Um, so you've been in these countries for a while. How has your perspective on race or well on privilege, nationality, and social concerns changed since being there? And maybe even as you look towards what recently happened in the US, um, how has that impacted that as well? Um, well, what I'll say is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably more confused now that I've, than I've ever been. Uh, I think when I was growing up, you know, you, you read and, and you have conversations with your family and, and, and you don't realize that it's, it's very uh, insular sometimes, your perspective. You think you're getting perspectives from everything, but your grandma, your mom, and the people in your school, like sometimes they all have a very similar kind of background, you know, particularly if uh, you know, they're from the States. Um, and what I'll say is, you know, in talking about confusion, uh, you know, I've been here 12, 12 years. Um, I recognize that I'm able to, for example, I can walk around in jeans and a t-shirt um, and, and, and people assume that I'm, you know, an educated person, assume that I, you know, because I look American for whatever reason, you know, regardless, um, they assume that I'm, you know, a good person and always, like I said, early until I prove otherwise. Um, so I recognize this. I recognize that instead of in the States, you know, I'm, you sometimes have to buy certain type of brands of clothing. Um, you know, I think, you know, that's a big issue with the side note, but you know, the black folks, we just buy a whole bunch of stuff we don't need, can't afford just to make other people think we have some value. Somehow here, I don't have to do that. So it makes me question people in the States who have these privileges, who have had them for generations and how they can not recognize that there's inequality or, you know, when I see a George Floyd, uh, uh, incident, you know, suddenly awake people to a privilege and privileges that they had or awaken them to realities of police brutality that they didn't see. And I'm like, you've been on earth 40 years and you, you, you didn't get the, the cops treat black folks a little different. Like I've been here 12 years and I can already figure out that I have more, sometimes more experiences than an indigenous person that comes from a small pueblo or a small village here or and so, you know, I'm more confused now uh, than I was and because it's harder for me to assess people. I don't know where certain things, certain types of thinking comes from. Um, and so that perspective, just, you know, almost being at peace with my confusion and just reading and talking and engaging with people and, and, and enjoying that um, and being more open, uh, you know, that has kind of been a, a change for me. Um, and what I'll also say in terms of, uh, you know, nationality which is you know very important um you know for the people who speak spanish here um and here sometimes you'll hear the word gringo this reminds me of something crystal said um and i'm like i never feel like they're talking about me um you know i like to me gringo is a white americans or, or white travelers or you know maybe canadian but you know it's basically white americans and and it's like wow okay that doesn't okay so what am i and then, you know, people, I hear people say expat. I'm like, I don't really sound like me either. You know, so, you know, all these things change uh, 
And, and, and now I'm in a point where it's like, okay, I have to actually come up with new vocabulary because if I don't feel like those things apply to me, now I got to figure out, you know, how to, how to call myself and what I want others to say. So right. and it's really interesting is just how your perspective changes um, overall living overseas. I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I'll go. Some of the things that has kind of like changed my perspective is, you know, Costa Rica is not a country that I am a citizen in. So I do have to pay attention to what's going on in the government. You know, if they don't want any more Americans here because of the COVID-19, you know, those are things that I have to be conscious of. And, you know, it made me really empathize more than I already tried to um, in the sense of what are our other Latin or other people, you know, in the Caribbeans or, you know, in African countries, what they're experiencing when they're in the States and they're kind of worried about like being displaced in a place that they have made their home. Um, and so it kind of just like makes me, you know, think about that because now being abroad, um, America, you know, American, being an American does have its privilege, but right now we're not really wanted in a lot of different countries right now due to what's going on. So I'm just like, well, what happens if the government decides like Americans got to leave? I've got to reshift my life up. Not saying that will happen, but it's something that I have to always be ready for plan B or C. And then another thing that, you know, I've been conscious of is, you know, I do have um, quite a bit of friends here who are part of the LBGTQ community. And to see kind of like that impact in a Latin, uh, in a Latin country, Costa Rica just um, passed, what was it, gay marriage. They're like the first uh, Central American country to do that. And that's a landslide, but it, it's really reflective of how much we have to do as uh, as the world, as a full-on um, global community to continue to allow equality. None of us are equal until all of us, you know, have equality. And so, you know, it makes me realize, like, I have got to get my head out of the clouds of just what's going on in the States and be conscious of my other brothers and sisters around the world. And that also goes for a wage disparity. You know, what I thought was poor, you know, um, when you go to some people's houses, which is no judgment, if anybody uh, offers to, you know, allow me in their home, you know, I'm more than gracious, but you can go into somebody's home and you're like, oh, wow, you know, what was, you know, minimum wage, $15 an hour or whatever it is in some states, you know, when people are making $7 an hour and, you know, they're gracious for it, but you get to see the wage disparity and what's going on in the States when people are almost trillionaires and you got people who are making $7 an hour, we got a lot of work to do. And so it just kind of makes me realize like the world as a collective, we're separate. We are told that we're separate, but as a collective, we got to, you know, really get on it and, um, you know, make some change for sure. And so that's what has been going on. Yeah. And I mean, I think I could best explain this answer to the question by explaining like, how I got into travel. Um, I grew up in a very, half my life I grew up in Baltimore County, Maryland, which is majority black. And then my family moved to Frederick County, Maryland, which is very much Trump country. Um, and so when I was in high school, I didn't see a lot of people who looked like me. And I started going on YouTube and found people who looked like me who were singing songs in Spanish and were talking about issues that I felt like I was dealing with and I was just like yo this is this is amazing I felt seen in a really weird way I guess because at the same time it's different contexts but similar issues and so through that I started becoming more interested in like what does the black experience look like all over the world um, and so in Colombia specifically um, I've been so 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 grateful for um, well, Backing up a little bit, I come from also like a human rights background um, and so work around like displacement issues and work around like, I don't know, like what does internal conflict mean for people who are Afro descendants, right? And so the amount of organizing that I've seen Black folks do in Colombia is amazing. And those movements are often led by really amazing Black women and also queer folks who are like risking their lives. There's, uh, there. I don't know, I'm going to go too deep into that if I start talking about that. And so what I will say is that I've been really grateful for um, the people who I see who are like 
proudly and boldly fighting for Black people around the world to just be free and be happy and to like be liberated. And that has made me feel also like more empowered here, more empowered to like assist other people in knowing what's happening abroad as well. And also just think about like, what does transnational solidarity look like and how can we do it um, in a way that, like how do we do that when sometimes we don't even speak the same language? But people get around that and it's been so amazing. Social media has allowed people to connect through like through pictures and memes sometimes and we have Google Translate. And so like my understanding of race and privilege and all of that I think has just been kind of elevated or mm, elevated it's not the right word but it it has become even more so because of the experiences that I've had and because of the really strong relationships that I've been able to make with people like all around the world I think we're all fighting for similar things and to the extent that we can support each other um it's like we're I don't know we're just great is how I feel yeah. great great um Okay, so um, quickly we had a question from the audience and I'm just gonna ask you, was it essential for you to know the local language um, when living, while living abroad or um, did you learn it eventually? How did that happen for you? And anybody can answer. Okay, um, so in Costa Rica, there's actually quite a bit of Ticos who um, speak English. And so I started studying before I got here, um, but to have meaningful relationships and kind of expand on the relationships that you have with other Ticos, it is important to know their local language. I don't think that you can have like a full, um, you can make it by and talk to them, but if you wanna have like a great connection with somebody, it's best to know their language, it's respectful. Um, and then, the, you know, Spanish is different in each region. So you've kind of got to, you can learn at your home country, but when you get to the place that you want to go to, like um, Costa Rica is formal Spanish, so they don't use two, they only use the stud. So it's kind of learning that and it's kind of learning their slang. So you should want to, you know, know their language and get around and because not everybody's going to know how to speak English and you're lucky if they do. Yeah, I would, I would agree with everything Bianca said. Um, I knew Spanish before I went and I think it really allowed me to have a great experience. But I will say that if you don't know the language yet, I don't think that should stop you or like, um, I, you should probably take a little extra precautions. But while you're there, there's so many different groups. There's couch surfing that has a lot of different activities for people to come together. Um, there's language exchange groups too and so like just be cognizant of that and also recognize like that yeah it's like it, like you should know the language because it is very much a respectful thing um, at the same time that it could present you with some security issues um, but if you do have like a real strong desire to go um, for really genuine reasons especially like definitely try to go um, and try as hard as you can to like absorb the language and make con connections um even if even if it's kind of hard to communicate sometimes i will say really quickly um if you get lost i swear you will figure out how to speak language if you need to go somewhere you need to buy something or you need help you will figure it out real quick because that has happened to me i i figured it out and i got to where i needed to go so you will learn it if you need to Right. And for the people who do have issues with uh, with the language and in terms of like maybe you studied a language and just can never, you know, I'm horrible, I was horrible in my French class or my Spanish class, I was horrible. Like when you're abroad, you also realize that, you know, you don't have, you don't use a, a ton of vocabulary. You, you learn to be very direct. Like, so, you know, if I'm lost and I want to get you know, downtown, you know, I'm on a bus somewhere, I'm trying to get downtown. Or maybe I don't know how to say, hey, listen, how do I find my way? Like all the elaborate ways I may say it in English. Um, so I'll just say a landmark. And I'm like, okay, I'll say Sokolo. And he's like, okay, well, that's the town square. So no matter what, 
you know, somebody can kind of point me in a direction to help me get back there. Um, you know, things like, you know, you don't worry about president past tense and all those things the same way. If I say, yesterday I go to the store, well, you know, I went, you know, so then you'll probably say, oh, you went to the store. Oh, yeah, it's, it's when, like, you know, you, you learn kind of choppy, but, but it's, uh, you slowly figure it out. So it's definitely possible. Okay. All right. So, um, for Walter and Bianca, what profession, what is your profession in the country that you're in? I'm a professor at a university here. Okay, nice. So I work remotely for a telehealth company. Um, so I work with psychologists. Okay, nice. All right, and for um, individuals in the audience who may consider moving abroad or, you know, um, living in another country just like you are, um, what advice do you have for them? Um, how should they prepare themselves for something like that, that transition? Uh, well, so, Bianca, you want me to go first? Okay. Uh, I saw the, the microphone there. Um, what I would say is, is the most important thing, uh, at least from my end, was uh, you know, I essentially, for two years before I moved here, uh, made a very conscious effort to make sure I had no debt. Um, I know that's a challenge for different people in different ways, but you know, it was like no restaurants, no going to the movies, no buying any outfits. Like I literally would like, you know, I'm going, if I looked at this restaurant and it could be anything, you know, uh, uh, the Applebee's, you know, warm brownie Sunday ice, man, I used to love that thing. But uh, <laughs> so I can, I can get with that, you know, that $10 I'm going to spend on this thing or $8 I'm going to spend on, you know how many tacos I can get with that. Um, so I made a really conscious decision to, uh, to not come here with debt because I think I've met a lot of black people in particular who have come to Oaxaca, loved it, uh, wanted to stay, but they had so many burdens in the states with things that they had to pay that they unfortunately, um, you know, weren't really, they weren't able to, or able to stay. Um, now, now with things being online, there's a lot of opportunities to work, uh, you know, receive a salary in, in dollars and live in another country and all those things. But um, that would be my, my first advice, um, set of advice. I would also say um, getting in shape uh, in some way. Um, if you're not somebody that goes to the gym or runs and does, does all those things, um, because you're going to get lost. Um, and this, you know, most of the people, when we go to places, we usually go to places that are hot. Um, and you're walking around and you got your backpack and you have some things, you know, you know, you know, on your shoulders and, and you have to figure out, um, and somebody says, hey, you know, you ask somebody for directions here and they'll say, okay, everybody always pretends they know. So they say three blocks this way, make it, and then you realize, damn, this ain't it, you know, or, you know, they didn't realize it was, it was, it's a line on each corner of that uh, area and they just sent you to the first line, but there's a line on each corner and you still can't find a place. All these little things that happen. Um, so I would definitely say, get yourself, get your health together. Um, I, I say get in shape, it's really get your health together because um, I think that is just important in general, but particularly if you're going to go overseas. Uh, I'll stop there. Ooh, yes, to the health part, because uh, being in Costa Rica, there's a lot of inclines and we hike a lot and probably about the first two months I was almost having a heart attack every time we go outside or and you know the people are so used to being in this climate and the structure of you know kind of how the the natural landmarks are they sprint up and, and I'm just like on me you know I'll get there when I get there so I wish I probably should have worked out a little bit harder before I came to Costa Rica but some of the things that, you know, um, you can prepare for. Now, mine's a little bit different because it was a little bit easier for me to transition because, like, you know, I don't have a husband or, you know, I don't have kids or how. So there wasn't as much baggage to transition from. But, you know, I really did take that year prior and just to make sure that, I you know, I had an initial plan um, of, you know, just like how much the savings, you know, I wanted you know, I knew where I wanted to live, kind of just like how much, you know, monthly I'm, you know, going to be spending and, you know, what type of job offer, you know, I'm really going to accept. 
Um, so those things are really kind of important because in Central America, Costa Rica is on the more expensive side. So some people just want to come here and, you know, like, which I did a little bit of, but, you know, come here and kind of float the way, but then it gets expensive and then they realize they got no more money. So that you kind of just want to have an initial plan and really know like what province you want to live in. So it's good to just, you know, visit. Um, but a lot of things I did that most people wouldn't do or I wouldn't suggest, you know, I didn't have like a hardcore plan on like my living situation. It just kind of worked out. Um, and, you know, I just kind of like went with the flow of a lot of it. Um, but just kind of, you know, have a plan, have a decent savings. You know, coronavirus hit um, two months after I got here. So if I didn't have the savings, I would have been put in a really bad position. So you just got to be prepared for everything that could possibly go your way, um, especially if you're trying to work remote, because it does take a little bit more time to find a good remote position. All right. Thank you. All right. So as we're wrapping up uh, the questions, uh, final question for you is, would you like to stay abroad permanently? Uh, maybe for Crystal, are you planning, well, are you planning to go back abroad to live? Or are you planning to return within the next coming years? I hope not. I just couldn't. <laughs> I mean, anyway, Walter. <laughs> well, I can go. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I want to go back every day, every day. I really enjoyed being in Colombia. I think the energy was really... Um, you could really feel the energy in the air. I think it was really loud. Like there's music on the buses and there's music in the street. And like, I think Colombia has the largest amount of like public holidays in Latin America too. Um, there was just a general feeling of just kind of like seize the moment, take like have fun for today because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and so, yeah, in the next couple of years, I am trying to figure out how to return. Um, hopefully it works out and yeah, wish me luck. <laughs> All right. I guess uh, I'll go. Um, well, I, I have no plans on moving back to the, to the States. Um, you know, I, you know, kind of following up with, uh, some, you know, Crystal used the word energy. So I'll, I'll talk about energy. Um, you know, a lot of people will, will ask me, you know, miss, Black folks, or you know, do you miss? You know, they'll say some stereotypical thing, fried chicken, or you know, something. And and I and I, you know, what I tell them is that you know, it is amazing whatever energy you possess that you kind of emote. Um, it is amazing how things come back to you. And so here I am in a place that you know doesn't necessarily have a lot of uh, African Americans here traveling. We don't, we're not traveling that much anyway. Um, but suddenly you know i find myself bringing black students here so then i have these black folks coming in the summer then i have them coming in in the winter break and then i have these expat black folks that come out here and they spend their winters and and now suddenly when when uh if anybody's staying here you know two weeks or longer who's black some mexican will send them my way and so i'll get these random whatsapp messages like hey they told me i need to know you and you know, suddenly we're going to the mountains or going you know, to some waterfall together. Um, but, you know, all that to say that, like, whatever is important to you, it is amazing how you can kind of replicate it, duplicate it, whatever the word, you know, would be. Um, and so for anybody who is a little nervous about, you know, going to places where there are not a lot of us, um, I would just, you know, reiterate, it is amazing. Whatever is important to you, um, being abroad and being free allows you to, to put more energy into, into expressing that particular energy and, and passion that you have. And it's amazing, it'll come back to you. Um, so I'll stop with that. Um, you know, with everything that's going on, I don't really know if I'm gonna return back to the States. Um, I never say never, but I just like it here so much. I mean, I'm just really having a hard time really just thinking about my life returning there. Um, just especially with the relationships that I've cultivated. I love the culture. I love growing into the language. Um, and just like, just some of the greatness that I have here, I don't, I don't know if I'll find that or it'll be replicated back in the States. And um, just the people that I'm meeting from like all over the world and the opportunities that I'm getting that I I probably wouldn't get back in this not saying I can't but 
um, it's just, it's more freer here. And so, yeah, I don't really know if, um, never say never, but at the moment, I think I'm just gonna like bunker down, let the United States figure out what they got going on and as a collective, just trying to figure it out. So I'm just gonna stay here in paradise and keep this as my home. All right. So now we'll take some questions from our, from our audience. And Rena, you wanna? Do you have any questions? I, well, I don't know. Let me see if I can do it. There's no questions that have come through. It looks like. Okay. There was one. Oh, was that by Walter about the hair care? Oh, never mind. Oh, talk about it. Health, hair care, right? Hair care. <laughs> well, do y'all want to talk about hair? We can talk about hair. Because, <laughs> sure. every, like, first of all, we know that it's, it's a whole thing. And I know when I was going abroad, it was a few years, I think maybe like three, four years after I went natural. And I had never traveled abroad before. And so I didn't know what it was going to look like when I was in Colombia in the first city that I was in. Um, it's a very metropolitan city, but uh, the black people didn't live where I was. And so there wasn't a lot, of, a lot of black hair things either. So I was like, let me just make this simple. Um, and I just did braids um, to make sure that I didn't have any problems, but I like to touch my hair. <laughs> and so four weeks in, I took my braids out and then had to figure out what that looked like. And so, yeah, please bring hair products like you're, you're gonna be happy. You're gonna be grateful for your past self because I did not do that. And I had to go through the store and use Gorilla Snot, which I don't even know, I, I, it didn't work out, but in the end it was okay. Um, so bring hair products, please. The struggle is real. I did not expect COVID-19 to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm like on my last drops. I'm gonna have to go through this whole process of trying to get hair care here and you know I got my weave on so I got braids in here and they are just struggling because I need my routine you know my hair is just very used to it and I can't go down to the store I did find Cantu out of like this random pharmacy um so I'm gonna have to go back and get, I'll just take anything that is of black hair care but you gotta be prepared load up because you're just not gonna find it that also goes for makeup you're just not gonna find the Fenty Beauty 420 <laughs> and above. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> I will say in Colombia, the, the second time I went, I went to Cali, which I think is the city with the second largest Afro descendant population in Latin America. And like people had their own businesses. There was a lot of black owned like fashion, uh, hair care. Um, it also has, I think I mentioned, um, the Pet Petronio Alvarez Festival, which is the largest or second largest black festival in the world, which I would love to talk about if anybody wants to hear about that. Um, and so within that festival, they also have a part where you just have, um, what is, uh, it's like artesanías, but I don't know how to say that in English. Just, Can you uh, say it again? Artesanías, like, like, hint. Uh, the stuff where they sell stuff. They have vendors and people who are selling things and like hair. Um, I see people asking about the festival and so I'm gonna put it in the chat really quickly. Um, and you can find YouTube videos because it's really amazing. And my experience was really transformative. Essentially the festival was created by the city um, mayor to celebrate and disseminate the cultural traditions of the Pacific region, which is 90% black. And during that festival, it's a whole week, people don't go to work. And every night you just have large festivals and large crowds of people who are really celebrating um, the traditions and the cultures, as I mentioned, because the Pacific region in large part, uh, because of the way slavery happened in Colombia, like was able to preserve a lot of Afro descendant traditions, Afro descendant cultural practices. And so the festival really allows people from the Pacific region to feel at home at the same time that there are really problematic things that happen, mostly from the mestizo people, the white Colombians who come in 
and like to take from it. For example, there was a white man who dressed up like a black woman and was holding a black, um, I hope this is okay if I say, it was a black wooden penis um, and was going around and taking pictures with people and talking about like, oh, like it's so sexy and stuff like that. And again, like when you think about stereotypes of Afro-Colombian people and of people in the diaspora in general, it was really just disheartening to see that at a festival that was supposed to celebrate black culture. Um, but the festival I think had 100,000 people who attended last year every day. And so it's huge. And people talked about how like, if you're separated from your family, for example, there was a war that was 54 years. And so a lot of people were kicked out of their homes. Um, and people talked about that festival being the only way that they could like reconnect with family members that they hadn't seen in forever and friends that they hadn't seen. And when I went as like a black person and as an American person, like because of my accent, people could tell I was different, but they were like, oh, like you're black, let's hang out over here. And it was really interesting to see like all the black folks on one side and the mestizo people on another side, often like just doing really kind of hurtful things, or at least I was hurt by some of the things that they were doing. Um, but it was beautiful. And if you can, please like go on the YouTube and check it out. All right. Okay, well, we'd like to thank our panelists for joining us here today. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. Um, and if, I guess, if anyone in the audience has any additional questions for you, um, if you would like us to share your information, please let us know and we'll be happy to do so. Our next upcoming event is in two weeks, um, July 30th. It is the last <laughs> episode in this series. And we are going to Wakanda. <laughs> we are going to the motherland. All right, so we look forward to having you guys join us on July 30th, um, same time, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Okay? Thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Crystal, I'm definitely going to have to check this festival out. Please I've never heard of it before. Yes. Thank y'all for such a great, you know, just, just open dialogue and sh you know, sharing your experiences. I was taking a lot of notes. Walter, I don't know about you, but I think I'll miss some fried chicken, but I do agree with you that wherever you go, you can make it home. You can make it yours. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and you can find some fried chicken. Uh, you would be, you'd be amazing. So. I was going to feel it. It'll be different. I didn't say that part. <laughs> but you know what? The fried chicken in Costa Rica is so good. And but the food in Mexico is fire. I'm trying to go to Oaxaca, Walter, so I'm going to come say hi. <laughs> All right, well, we'll definitely uh, reach out because I, I haven't been to Costa Rica, but I, I'm, I'm down. Okay, and then when I go back to Mexico, I'm going to come find you. Sounds good. Sounds good. All righty. Thank you. Let, really let me say this. So if you come out here, you don't need the weave. You don't need any of those special hair products. If you can, <laughs> let's say you can't find them products before you get here. They're gonna love you here regardless. So you don't have to worry about it. You know, I've been to I've been to Mexico City and they accept me however I choose. I just yeah. like it because I like it. But you know, they don't get whatever I deliver. I'm like this this COVID doesn't feel like it's going away anytime soon, so we might be missing yeah. out on <laughs> Facts. Alrighty. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Walter, thank you so much for participating. Thanks, Ms. Raina. As you, as you know, I'm, I'm always try. We 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 gonna do what we gotta do. Everybody wants to come down to Mexico now, so uh, uh, right. I do. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to I mean, you know, y'all are always welcome. I, I love hosting, hosting brown people out here. So, you know, it's just, uh, and, and you know, Rain has been out here, so she can always say, hey, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just. for it, 100%. We need a vacation. <laughs> for real, for real. And, and Trinidad yeah. uh, would also be on my list. My best friend at Morehouse was, uh,